Order. Can I ask members to please take their seats? It's time for questions to the Minister of Employment and Learning. And we will start with oral questions first. And I call Robin Swan. And questions number 6, 9 and 10 have all been withdrawn. Robin Swan. Question number one, Mr Speaker. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, I recognise the need for investment in the Northern Regional College area. My department awaits the, the outline business case from the College, which will, for, for, uh, which will consider the options for the provision of further education in the Ballymena, Ballymoney and Corian areas, where the accommodation is particularly poor. The business case will also consider future provision in the Larne area. The business case is considering the range of options to identify the value for money option, the funding requirements and the procurement route. Until the business case has been received, assessed and approved, I am not in a position to be, to be definitive about the College's future plans. However, I can assure you that my department is working hard with the College to ensure that, ongoing, uh, that going forward the learners, the employers and the community in the area will benefit from, from the state-of-the-art accommodation and equipment that are now available in other College areas. Robin Swan. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. But would the Minister agree with me that the removal of the NRC campus in Ballymoney will be a further blow, blow to that town? And as Minister responsible for employment and learning and higher and further education, what can he do to ensure that there still is a provision for the people of Ballymoney? Well, I thank the member for his question and, and, and supplementary. And it's important to bear in mind that what we are trying to achieve uh, in terms of the further education of the state is to ensure we have modern accommodation and the best facilities uh, for the education and training of our young people and indeed others uh, in, in society. Uh, it is important that uh, we have proper economies of scale uh, in what we're seeking to do. Uh, and that means that um, uh, investing in, in, in modern, up-to-date facilities where often a lot of uh, things can be, be, be brought together. It's also important to bear in mind that whenever we look at terms of whether a college should, should appear in every town across Northern Ireland, that even at present, uh, certain, only certain courses are delivered uh, in certain campuses of the existing colleges uh, and not in, in others. And that, again, reflects the need uh, to invest uh, in, in a critical mass to ensure we're delivering a proper service uh, to, to young people. Um, however, irrespective of what happens, we are committed to ensuring that the people of Ballymoney will be able to access uh, further education as part of the Northern Regional College estate. Uh, and in, indeed, what's happened in other areas is that whenever uh, situations have arisen uh, where colleges have maybe been moved or relocated, that community facilities have been provided to ensure that there is that ready access uh, for local people uh, to a range of courses. Paul Frey. Mr. Frey. The Minister. What sort of signal does this send out to my constituents of Balamone when we try to tell them on one hand that apprenticeships and vocational uh, jobs are important to us and that they, link up, they must link up with the educational facilities in the schools, but yet we are hearing now that it's going to be removed from them? What sort of message does that send out to industry and manufacturing in Balamone? Well, we haven't, with respect, sent out any uh, negative message. Uh, I've been very clear that we are uh, still not yet formally in receipt of a business case from Northern Regional College, so it's important members don't jump to any conclusions and prejudge the outcome in that regard. But even if we are to see a consolidation of, of colleges, that is to provide an improved offer to all of the people of Northern Ireland, including the people of the North, North Antrim and East, East London Derry um, constituencies. Uh, the best way we can be uh, of service is to ensure we're providing the best possible training in modern uh, facilities, and we're committed to making those type of investments. Simply arguing for the maintenance of the status quo is actually going to end up serving our young people poorly. Uh, we need to be making investments uh, for, for the future. That's the way we actually provide modern apprenticeships, better vocational training, and invest in our economy. Uh, Jim Allister, Mr. Allister. The Minister may, of course, say no decisions are made, but listening to him, it's pretty clear that he's preparing what mightn't even be such a soft landing, but a soft landing in respect of diminishing, if not removing, the provision in Ballymoney. money. Does he not think there's a contradiction between out of one side of his mouth telling this House very laudably about the need to prepare young people for apprenticeships, etc., and then stripping out of towns? hard-pressed towns like Balamone, the very facility which could equip its young people to take advantage of such apprenticeships. 
uh, question of any soft landing uh, for everyone. The blunt reality here is that we have to invest properly in the future uh, of our, our young people, people, and that means proper modern facilities. And in order to achieve that, we have to move away from parochial thinking around all of this. If we expect um, to, there to be uh, an all singing, all dancing, full provision FE college in every market town across Northern Ireland, then we're going to be, be spreading our resources too thinly, and that we may well serve local political uh, agendas fine, but we will not be serving the interests of the young people of Northern Ireland, nor will, will we be addressing the needs of employers and the future of the economy. John Dodd. Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, Minister, agree with me. There's nothing parochial about Balamoni or Coleraine uh, aspiring to have a first-class uh, technical college, as they were called. And indeed, would he agree with me that Balamoni is a long, proud tradition during the worst years of the troubles of bringing people together to train them and to make them good citizens? Well, I absolutely I recognise the, the work that has been done uh, within the Ballymoney campus alongside all of our FE campuses in bringing uh, people uh, together. And what is important as we look, we look ahead is that we are investing in a modern estate uh, that will cover a significant catchment areas. There is no question whatsoever of us uh, not providing state-of-the-art facilities in that, that, the northern section of the NRC's uh, catchment area. And that is what the business case is seeking to identify, what is the most uh, viable op option on the way forward. Uh, I certainly recognise that the, there is, has been historically uh, an underinvestment uh, in that area compared to other parts uh, of Northern Ireland, and I am committed to addressing that. And ho hopefully members will see the benefits of such investments for, the, for both the local communities in those areas and also for the local economy. Paul Frey. Um, I recognise that securing greater levels of participation in apprenticeships from small and micro business is vital. In January, I announced the outcome of the review of apprenticeships through the publication of an interim report that is out for consultation until the 7th of April. In the interim report, my department has committed to examining how to best resource a new apprenticeship model and to support employers. This will include consideration of the implications for Northern Ireland uh, from the HMRC-led funding model uh, announced by the UK Chancellor in his autumn statement, and this budget's extension to, of the, to, to the grant aid for small businesses taking on apprentices. Discussions with the Department for Business, Innovation and Skills have been taking place to explore the implications for Northern Ireland, including the impact of any future reduction of corporation tax. My department will also be piloting a range of interventions aligned to the review's final policy proposals to test concepts to help ensure we have the right support for businesses to employ apprentices. Proposals include a central service to promote and support apprenticeship provision for both employers and participants. For the employers, the service will administer subsidies and other support, centrally advertise em uh, employer apprenticeship vacancies, provide a matching service between employers and prospective apprentices, signpost employers to approved providers of off-the-job training and provide a small business service to help small to medium-sized businesses access the benefits of an apprenticeship programme. Through the current Apprenticeship NI programme, my department supports the off-the-job training required for achievement of qualifications set out in apprenticeship frameworks. In addition, an employer also receives a payment when the apprentice successfully completes the Apprenticeship NI programme. The incentive ranges from £250 to £1,500, depending on the complexity and level of the apprenticeship undertaken. Paul Frey. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And whilst the Minister will want to analyse the statement in full that the Chancellor made at the Budget Statement, uh, does he at this time uh, see any barriers being placed for Northern Ireland to implement uh, the, the uh, recommendations from the Chancellor and any mirroring? of that in Northern Ireland. Are there any barriers, whether it be time scales, old contracts, that he can uh, tell the House of today? Well, I'm grateful uh, to uh, the, the member for his question. I think, first of all, it's important to bear in mind that there is considerable time in, the, in this regard. And the, the proposed new funding system uh, may not be in place for, for a, a number of years. Uh, it's at, at present, uh, there is there's a consultation uh, around how the measure will actually work in, in practice. What is absolutely critical in this regard, uh, and I have made this point uh, to the Department for Business, Innovation and Skills, as have my counterparts in Scotland and Wales, is that this is designed uh, with the needs uh, of all four nations of the UK uh, taken into account. 
We can't have a situation where something comes through that is essentially uh, driven through um, our, our tax uh, and, and revenue system uh, that has uh, UK-wide application but is designed to simply to uh, coalesce around the model of apprenticeships that is taken forward in England uh, alone. So it is important that we have that rounded solution. I do believe that the creation of incentives uh, in the medium term will be of fundamental importance uh, to incentivising employers to take on uh, apprentices. Uh, we certainly need many more employers to step forward and to see this as something that is beneficial uh, to them beyond any particular financial incentive in terms of the needs of, of their business. <clears throat> One of the particular issues that we do need to be mindful as we move forward is that um, compared to the economy in England, uh, we have a greater share uh, of our businesses who are small and medium-sized enterprises. Starkly, they have been more reluctant to undertake apprentices than larger companies. So we need to make sure that whatever system is designed will properly capture the, the particular profile of our local economy and not simply just the, the profile of the economy in England. Uh, Robin Swan. Mr. Swan. Much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Minister, in the same statement, the Chancellor said that from the 6th of April 2015, there would be a removal for Class 1 national insurance contributions for those employees under 21. How will that benefit Northern Ireland employees, employers? Well, that, that's something that's out with my particular responsibilities as the Minister for Employment and, and Learning. Um, but I do very much welcome uh, that commitment from uh, the UK government uh, to in incentivising um, companies taking on um, young people. We need a rounded approach in terms of how uh, we can address the issue of youth uh, unemployment. We have certain levers that within our power and responsibility and that uh, we are doing great work to invest in skills, uh, technical skills and employability skills. Uh, but any tax incentives um, that can be produced across the UK as a whole will, will also benefit Northern Ireland and certainly what is suggested uh, and set to, to take place in 2015 I think uh, makes a lot of sense and, and will uh, certainly uh, be uh, another uh, asset in terms of our efforts uh, to address the issue of youth unemployment. Phil Flanagan. Mr Flanagan. I want to thank the, the Minister for his answers. Um, can the Minister give us an indication as to what efforts he has taken not only to make apprenticeships more attractive to business but particularly for young people? Um, particularly in terms of, of actually giving them a decent hourly wage which they can actually live on? Um, well, well, first of all, um, the member will be aware that we are currently um, concluding the consultation on our review of uh, apprenticeships. We are seeking to have a, a radical uh, reshaping of the, the skills landscape and we see a major role for uh, modern apprenticeships in that regard. We want to see apprenticeships moving to a much wider range of occupations. We want to see apprenticeships uh, model uh, moving up uh, the skills ladder and off offering people uh, progression routes. We want to see apprenticeships being a viable alternative to the more traditional um, higher education model. And ultimately, for um, both an employer and a young person, this makes uh, a lot of sense. For the employer, they know they're getting the very particular skills that are required uh, for their business. And a young person will also know uh, that they're investing in skills that make them much more employable, and they will have a greater prospect of earning a good wage or salary, and indeed for uh, sustained um, employment. So it makes a lot of sense all around uh, for everyone. Um, there are uh, rules around the payment uh, of uh, apprentices and the, the, uh, in terms of national minimum wage. So those aren't uh, for me to determine. They're determined on a UK-wide basis. But it is important to bear in mind that um, many employers will be paying in advance of what those minimum wage rates um, would be. But ultimately, uh, this is a good investment for a young person. Uh, and indeed, um, the fact that someone is actually paid uh, while they are learning or training uh, is uh, very attractive, particularly compared to what happens in terms of tuition fees and the issues of debt that are associated with that. Mr. Craig. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question number three. Uh, since the 2008-09 academic year, total enrolments at the Lisburn campus of the South Eastern Regional College have increased by around 61 per cent, which is considerably higher than, than at the, the College's other campuses. Between 2008 and 2009 and the current academic year, the number of full-time students at the Lisburn campus has risen from 672 to 1,160, an increase of some 72 per cent. This is an extremely positive performance, and the College is to be congratulated for the valued service it is providing to learners, employers and the community in the Lisburn area. Undoubtedly, the recent major investment in state-of-the-art accommodation in Lisburn has been a contributing factor in this success. 
It is, of course, for the College to manage the use of resources and the delivery of provision to meet the needs of learners across its entire region. My department does not intervene in this process. However, the College has advised me that it is taking a number of measures to address the accommodation pressure in Lisburn so that, that it can continue to meet the needs of learners in the area. This includes the retention and use of some premises that had previously been deemed a surplus to requirements and making adjustments to the delivery of curriculum and to timetabling. While the Lisburn campus fully meets the capacity set out in the original specification, the College is also considering how best to utilise accommodation across its whole estate, for example, by moving some courses to other campuses in the coming academic year. Jonathan Craig. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for that very comprehensive answer. Um, I'm very proud of the actual success that there's been in the College as one of those who actually pushed for the new campus to be there. Would the Minister like to comment on the fact that the College does seem to be one of only two in the whole of the United Kingdom who actually provides research-based apprenticeships within it? And is there any room to expand that type of apprenticeship, as it does seem to be one of the huge successes, not only in Northern Ireland, but right throughout the UK? To the member for his, his comments, um, I certainly uh, would join him in congratulating the College uh, for the, their endeavours um, around both apprenticeships and uh, research. And it's important to, to bear in mind uh, that our colleges um, are a huge asset uh, to our local economy and do offer that range of services. And it's not just simply in terms of training and upskilling uh, that they're relevant. They also are uh, significant players in terms of research and development. Uh, and in particular, uh, they should be the first point of call for uh, many small and medium-sized businesses uh, with regard to research and, and innovation. And often there will be a very heavy focus upon uh, practical issues and uh, how uh, different ideas can be uh, brought to bear to improve, uh, to improve businesses. The member will also be aware that we are conducting uh, the review of apprenticeships at, pre at present. Uh, we have huge ambitions for what, what we want to do with respect uh, to apprentices, and I see no reason why the, the type of course of action he set out uh, would be uh, inconsistent uh, with that review, and certainly something we're very happy to look at and to embrace. Doris Kelly. Mrs Kelly. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, Mr. Speaker, can I ask the Minister, in terms of looking at the profile of the service users, how will their needs be taken account of when looking for alternative accommodation? Well, that, that's something that's very uh, much for uh, the College uh, to, to, to manage, and they will have to approach that and take into account uh, the issues that the Member um, has, has set out. Um, obviously, not every college or every um, campus of each college provides each particular course. There has to be a degree of, of specialism uh, if we are to provide a fully rounded uh, curriculum. So, a degree of, of travel and commuting is part and parcel of people's engagement with the modern um, FE estate. But certainly, I think th there would be uh, a lot of, uh, of thought given to what particular courses are, are uh, uh, supplied in other campuses and which ones are retained in Lisburn. Joanne Dobson. Mrs. Dobson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can the Minister inform the House how future demand for courses is managed by the regional colleges um, across the geographic spheres, including Lisburn campus, especially given the implications of the looming withdrawal of entitlement framework funding by the Education Minister? Well, our, our FE sector is a huge asset, as I've already stated, uh, to um, our, our local economy. It is for the colleges themselves to manage their, their curriculum and how they distribute that. Uh, but the member does make uh, an important point in relation uh, to uh, the entitlement uh, framework. It is important uh, that uh, whenever we are thinking about the future needs of our, of our young people, that we offer them the full breadth of, of academic and uh, vocational uh, courses and, and, and qualifications. And without uh, favouring one sector over another, we, we have to have a, a realisation uh, that certain facilities uh, are more in keeping with, provi with providing the real quality in terms of that, that offering. And at times, um, I do get concerned uh, whenever schools sometimes uh, 
out of very good um, principle, um, seek to try to replicate uh, the, the offering of, of vocational courses, which can be better provided within the FE setting whenever they have the, the, the opportunity to invest in better equipment and provide other advantages that come from, from economies of scale. So I think it's important that uh, we don't uh, turn inwards around the entitlement framework, that we actually fully develop the area learning partnerships and fully deploy the assets that are there within our FE sector. Michelle McElveen. Ms. McElveen. Question for Mr. Speaker. The rationale for the University of Ulster's Greater Belfast development is driven by the, the university's need to replace the Jordanstown campus. As a result of the relocation, all activities currently based at Jordanstown will transfer to Belfast by 2018, with the exception of student residences, the world-class high-performance sports centre and the fire safety engineering facility. In line with the funding agreement between the University of Ulster and my department, the university submitted a biannual progress report uh, on September 30th, um, 2013. This showed that all of the milestones uh, to that, that date had been achieved, although uh, later than the, the uh, original anticipated dates in some cases. The university remains confident that the project will be delivered by 2018 within budget. In December 2013, the university secured a £150 million loan facility from the European Investment Bank towards the £250 million overall costs associated with the project. The demolition of Playboard House, York House and the Interpoint building have now been completed on schedule. The university's planning application for a mixed-use multi-storey car parking development on the Frederick Street site was rejected last year. The University appealed the decision with the Planning Appeals Commission and the Commission subsequently ruled in the University's favour on the, the, the uh, 7th of February 2014. The ruling by the Planning Appeals Commission allows the University to move forward with construction of the new campus and also on a range of related fronts, particularly in terms of the transport and housing needs associated with the development. My department will continue to, to support the relocation by working closely with the university and other key stakeholders to ensure that the potential significant economic, social, cultural and physical opportunities resulting from the development are maximised. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the Minister for his answer. The Ulster Sports Academy, located at the Jordan Town campus, have very ambitious and exciting plans to develop centres of, of excellence in sport at that location. I just, could I ask the Minister whether he supports um, their plans and what assistance he and his department are giving in order to develop business plans for those projects? Uh, well, uh, in principle, I, I'm very happy uh, to endorse that and recognise the, the quality of what the, the university um, are, are offering. And in, indeed, um, the, uh, the, the Vice Chancellor and, and his colleagues uh, are very keen uh, to stress the emphasis that the university are making in, in sporting matters. Um, we have not yet, yet been approached by the university for any direct assistance in the, the plans that the member has, has mentioned. It is, of course, for the university themselves to, to manage uh, their estate and investments. Uh, but in, in the event that they do feel the need to approach us for support, they know that they, they can do so. And we will have to consider that in the round alongside all, all other competing priorities. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker, um, I want to ask the minister if he can assure the House that this project will be completed within budget, unlike the recently reported Belfast Met development? Well, um, the member uh, should know that uh, it would be inappropriate for me to comment um, on the Belfast uh, Met uh, report, given that there is a pending um, meeting of the Public Accounts uh, Committee in that regard, and that is a long, well-established protocol um, in, in this House. Um, in, in relation to the University of Ulster site, um, I am pleased that uh, things are moving um, on, on schedule uh, and uh, that, that the, the, the project is uh, within budget. Um, it's important that we bear in mind this is a hugely important uh, investment for Belfast and indeed for all of Northern Ireland. It's perhaps the, the biggest uh, construction project at present and certainly the biggest we've had for a, a number of years. Uh, so there will be com complexities uh, with this and no doubt th there will be a few obstacles to overcome uh, over, over, the coming year, over the coming years, but we are moving ahead with this uh, and in, in a timely manner. Alwyn McGuinness. Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answers. <clears throat> Along with other colleagues, of course, I welcome the development uh, of the university, particularly in the constituency of North Belfast. I hasn't had uh, all politics being local, Mr. Speaker. Um, 
But could I uh, remind the minister that the university indicated to the local community there uh, that they would be sensitive to the needs of the local community in terms of housing, uh, and it's important that those uh, commitments uh, be adhered to. Would the minister encourage the university uh, to look at those commitments and to stick to them? I thank the member for his comments and indeed uh, his um, understanding of the importance uh, of this uh, uh, development uh, to not just North Belfast but indeed the uh, wider Northern Ireland um, as a whole. Um, the member will be aware that the university has established a community liaison forum. I am um, very mindful that there are issues around housing and transport that do need to be further uh, bottomed out. Um, I am very keen to impress upon the University of ensuring that they get these right, and I know members will join me in, in that regard. I am certainly happy to use whatever influence I have uh, to encourage uh, any particular further meetings that need to take place with the community uh, to provide a re either reassurance or to take into account uh, some particular local issues that need to be factored in uh, to, to developments. But it is important to bear in mind that this um, redevelopment will be of benefit to the local community in terms of increased economic economic activity and there should be access uh, to, to, to jobs and employment for people from North Belfast as indeed from other parts of Northern Ireland. Uh, but it is something that will be on the doorstep of that, of that uh, community. Um, there will also be social clauses in relation to uh, construction of this facility which again will offer uh, employment um, opportunities uh, and it's important that we, we uh, skill people um, with the, the, uh, the necessary basis in which to compete uh, for those opportunities. Well, I thank the Minister for his answer, but just to follow on uh, what Alvin McInnes has said, that there was a lot of annoyance in around that community when the university actually ap appealed the case, because you're dealing with an area of high social housing demand, and would the Minister encourage uh, the, the, the university uh, to, to not only uh, take part in discussions with the local community, but be actively uh, look at, when they're looking at housing for students, uh, to put in place uh, to put in place a, a system where they can look at other parts of land that would fulfil housing need in the area? Um, I am uh, very happy uh, to encourage those type of uh, discussions. I should caution that it is not for the university alone to, to address all of the particular housing issues uh, that um, are, are present in North Belfast, but it is important that the university is, is conscious of the wider context in terms of, 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 of housing in, in that area. Um, I do think it was important that the planning uh, permission was eventually granted in relation uh, to uh, the car park. And that, the fact that it did ultimately go for car parking use, I don't think it should detract uh, away from other consideration of how housing needs can be addressed uh, in, in the area. It's important that the university had the ability to actually fulfil uh, its, its, its wider plans, uh, and that, that aspect was critical. And if that didn't get permission, uh, it would have been a, a, a fundamental um, challenge uh, to the ability to complete the development in a timely manner. Order members Paul Gervin not in his place. Uh, Megan Fear. Um, increasing cross-border student mobility is identified as a key issue in the higher education strategy graduating to success. And my department has a keen interest in addressing obstacles which impact on student mobility. As such, my officials receive regular updates on the issue of the recognition of qualifications from colleagues in the Department of Education. The report that the Council for Curriculum Examinations and Assessment has been meeting with the Irish Universities Association over the past three years. In the initial meetings, it had been agreed that the overarching principle should be fairness for all applicants to higher education institutions in the Republic of Ireland. Considerable statistical work was undertaken on the overall GCE, leaving certificate grade outcomes. This, however, has so far failed to provide definitive basis for progress. As a result of the work undertaken, other significant issues were, were identified, such as the need to take all A-levels in one sitting and the non-acceptance of some uh, Level 3 qualifications. The current significant developments with post-16 qualifications currently underway in both jurisdictions represent a further complication. I understand that the, the Irish Universities Association will be producing a discussion paper in the, the next few months on a range of issues to support broader access to, to higher education institutions in the South. 
I welcome the fact that Trinity College Dublin, Dublin City University and Galway University have already indicated their willingness to consider ch changing entry requirements for students from Northern Ireland. Order members, that includes your questions uh, to the Minister. Uh, we now move to topical questions. And I call Patrick McLone. Mr McLone. Could I ask the Minister that, um, in light of anticipated changes on, on if you like, the follow-through of welfare reform, uh, does he have any projections for specially trained, further trained uh, people employed in job centres with, to deal specifically with people with profound disability needs? Well, what I can say to the member is that we are currently uh, reviewing um, our uh, disability employment service and uh, we are working towards the development of a disability employment uh, strategy. Uh, we have a number of particular uh, programmes um, already in, in that regard, uh, which we, we wish to re refine uh, further. Uh, also to set uh, more effective targets and measurements in terms of our progress in, in that regard. Um, it is likely that that particular service will focus on those uh, people um, who are capable of accessing work uh, but have uh, some more, more challenging um, conditions. There is a wider pool of, of individuals who have um, uh, essentially been excluded or excluded themselves uh, from the labour market uh, due to disability related factors uh, who fall into the wider economic inactivity uh, category. And the member will be aware that we are currently uh, developing a strategy in conjunction uh, with the Department for Enterprise, Trade and Investment uh, in, in that regard. And uh, that is currently out for consultation. And uh, over the, the next number of months, we are hoping to finalise um, that, that strategy and, and proposals therein. Uh, I thank the Minister for, for his answer. Uh, would the Minister advise if it is anticipated that uh, extra people, extra personnel, will in fact be put in place to deal with those people who will be coming into the centres with complex disabled needs? Uh, well, I think in, in, in the first instance, what we want to do is to ensure that we continue to invest in training of, of existing staff uh, to ensure that they are able to uh, respond uh, to the broad range uh, of, of clients uh, that, uh, that we, our, our uh, employment advisors uh, would, would be dealing with. Uh, and I'm confident that with, with the proper training, we have the, the, the skilled and dedicated people who are capable of providing that service. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Vertin Ifri Dinara, Chocolate Turishka, Hortstuin, Aran Chonskan of Kapachiakta, Ata Bartihe, the College of Regund and Jeskirch in Ardwaka. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Could I ask the Minister, could he give us uh, an update on the uh, capital scheme which is proposed for the Southern Region, Regional College in Armagh? Thank you. Well, at this stage, um, my uh, department uh, has received um, the outline business case uh, from uh, Southern Regional College, uh, which covers um, Armagh, Banbridge, and uh, Craig, Craig Avon. Um, we hope to be able to consider uh, that uh, proposal uh, swiftly. Um, again, in, in common with uh, the Northern Regional College area, we recognise that there has not been as much investment in the SRC's uh, catchment area as there, be, as there has been in other parts of Northern Ireland. Uh, so, subject to resources, uh, we will be looking favourably on making uh, investments in that area, including hopefully in the Armagh area. Um, could I ask the Minister, uh, since he said that he would uh, deal with this issue in a speedy manner, could he give us uh, some type of time frame? Thank you. Um, well, I would certainly hope to be in a position uh, within the next uh, number of months. Um, it probably takes, a, 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 in the best, fastest uh, means, with, with three months or so, to consider uh, business cases, because you, uh, on something certainly at this scale and magnitude, and, and also the, the potential uh, amount of money in, involved, there has to be a degree of, of rigour and due diligence ar around um, all of this. But hopefully, we will be in a position uh, to give clarity uh, on at least the Armagh uh, situation uh, during the course uh, of, of 2014. And, uh, and saying that, I, I don't mean towards the end of the year. Adrian McQuillan. Mr. McQuillan. Mr. Speaker, can I ask the Minister what he is doing to encourage more participation in the youth employment scheme through the private sector mainly? Uh, yes. Um, well, the, the member will be certainly aware that the youth employment scheme is uh, of critical importance 
uh, to enabling uh, young people uh, to get a, a foothold on the uh, employment ladder and to, to give them uh, critical employability skills uh, to allow them to, to compete uh, more uh, on a, on a more level playing field with other workers, uh, given their, their, their difficulties sometimes in having uh, the, the necessary and relevant experience. Uh, the member will be aware that we have an a, a advertising marketing campaign, uh, Skills uh, to, to Succeed, uh, which covers uh, a range of, of different interventions uh, that the department has to support people and, and skilling across the economy. As part of the executive's drive to ensure we're, we're, we're using money effectively, we have brought a lot of our advertising uh, together uh, within the single, single campaign. And uh, advertising the youth employment scheme is a critical aspect uh, of that. And hopefully uh, the member uh, will have come across the, the advertisements, uh, whether it's on television uh, or indeed on, on different forms of social media over the past number of weeks. Mr. Speaker, can I thank the Minister for his answer? Minister, would you agree with me that it's important to install the work ethic into young people at the earliest opportunity, and the Youth Employment Scheme is one of those schemes that, that could do that? Uh, very much so. Um, and what comes across time after time is the importance of employability skills. Uh, and that's the ability uh, of people uh, to engage uh, with, with the world of work uh, in terms of the, the, the disciplines of uh, timekeeping, um, the, the, the rigours of, of working as part of a team um, in, in, the, in the workplace, just to give two uh, particular examples. Uh, it's why also we put such a strong emphasis upon types of training such as apprenticeships and uh, traineeships. Uh, because a person's um, technical training goes alongside the, the picking up of the, the employability skills. It's also why we, we, we're keen to stress that um, even those at a, at a younger age uh, will take advantage of work experience opportunities uh, through, through schools or indeed colleges uh, to get a flavour of, of, the, of the world of work. Because what we're finding is that um, our young people have been disproportionately affected uh, by uh, the recession, and companies have, uh, at times have held on to their older workers uh, more than, than younger workers, and also that younger people have difficulty getting on the first rung of the ladder. And it's often that they don't have that experience and those employability skills to compete uh, with others, and the youth employment schemes are very much designed to, to try to break through that vicious circle. Katrina Ryan. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And can I ask the Minister? Um, just in relation to workers who are blacklisted for uh, union membership, what action he has taken in relation to that? Yes, uh, I'm pleased to inform uh, the member that we uh, have recently uh, signed off on, on regulations uh, in, in that regard um, to, to outlaw uh, blacklisting and to give workers protection uh, in that regard. And uh, th th there should be a statutory instrument uh, to, to come before the House uh, to confirm that uh, within the, the next uh, num number of weeks. Um, I do believe it is something that's important that we do intervene uh, on. It is um, a, a, a very unfair uh, situation, and it's important that people have the ability uh, to be part of trade un unions and, moreover, to, point to, to speak out uh, on, on particular issues of, of concern uh, without fear of the consequences uh, down the line. Katrina Ryan. I thank the Minister for his answer. And I just would um, ask are there any further steps he intends to take to protect? trade union members as a result um, from being targeted as a result of uh, members of a union? Um, well, on the back of the, 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 the blacklisting regulations that, that people will have recourse uh, to uh, employment protections, uh, including the use of tribunals uh, to, to enforce their rights in, the, in that regard. I think it's important to bear in mind that um, we don't think there's whole-scale whole abuse going on in Northern Ireland at present. However, there are perhaps some uh, isolated cases and indeed the potential uh, for, for more to, to happen. So it's important that we do close down uh, that, that, that uh, potential uh, to, to, to exist. Uh, and w once the regulations are fully in place, uh, it will fall uh, to my department and others uh, to ensure that they are properly enforced. Dr. Alistair MacDonald. Thank McDonald. you very much, Mr. Speaker. And could I ask the Minister what his department is able to do uh, to ensure that the statutory rights of those in zero hours contracts are being protected? Um, I'm grateful to the member uh, for, for his question. I think it's first of all important to bear in mind that the world of work is something that is evolving. Um, considerably, and that includes the, the manner in which people are employed and the structure 
of employment. And in that regard, it's important to recognise that in certain circumstances, zero-hours contracts may be an attractive option either for businesses or indeed for certain categories of workers. So we need to be cautious about a blanket approach that would rule out such employment models, particularly bearing in mind that people can move around the law and create new types of models to get around all of that. That said, there is considerable public uh, concern and disquiet over zero hours contracts and in particular the potential for abuse uh, in, in that regard. So it, it is my intention um, to bring a paper to the executive in the next uh, number of weeks uh, to instigate a public consultation um, to regulate uh, certain aspects of zero hours contracts. And in particular, the two aspects that we have in mind are, first of all, uh, steps uh, to uh, remove ex exclusivity, which essentially ties uh, a person uh, to a, a particular uh, company or, or organisation and leaves them entirely dependent upon the number of hours that would be provided by that company or, or organisation. And secondly, measures to better inform uh, individuals who may be on zero hours contracts of their existing rights. And it's worth stressing that there are a number of existing rights that people who are on zero hours contracts already have. Dr. Alistair MacDonald. I, I, could I thank the Minister for his response so far. But how, could, the, could I ask the Minister if he has any idea of how many people are on zero or contracts in the public service? I'm thinking particularly of the health service, but other similar services as well. Uh, again, this is a, an issue uh, that people are uh, trying uh, to, to bottom out. Um, there is a, a piece of research uh, that has been, is being conducted on a UK-wide basis that will include uh, Northern Ireland uh, within that. So we will hopefully get a, a, the beginnings of an accurate picture uh, in the next uh, number of months uh, in that regard. Um, my instinct is that the use of zero hours contracts is not as prevalent in Northern Ireland as it is in other parts of the UK, but nonetheless it, it is a feature of some aspects of our economy. Uh, I can't give precise figures on the health, serv the health service per se. Uh, no doubt the health minister can provide those answers. But we have taken soundings in terms of our own further education colleges and uh, universities, uh, and certainly they did not appear to be a, 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 a a large feature in terms of, of employment within those sectors and indeed in terms of the universities uh, they were virtually non-existent which stands in contrast to the pattern uh, of uh, what, what universities do in other parts of the UK. William Humphrey. Uh, Dr. Thank Humphrey. You, Mr Speaker I thank the Minister for his answer so far. Can I ask the Minister is the Minister confident that equality is being delivered in Northern Ireland universities and that no student should feel in any way discriminated against? Well it's important to bear in mind that our universities are um, not just shared space but fully integrated in terms of their uh, provision. And, uh, I do believe that in the main uh, a neutral environment is provided uh, for uh, people's education and training within the university setting. Uh, where people feel that is not the case uh, or where we are falling short in that regard, uh, I would encourage people who feel that to come forward uh, and talk to, the, to their university uh, in, 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 in such situations uh, to see if the particular situation does exist and, if it does exist, what measures can be taken to, to address it. William Humphrey. Uh, thank the Minister for his response. And I see the Minister says, in the main. Can I assure the Minister that I and party colleagues have met with some students representing an organisation called Union of Students recently? And some of the stories and testimonies and examples they have given us suggest that even when they have spoken to university officials, nothing has been done. Would the Minister commit to meet with me and party colleagues to address this issue and the concerns, these real concerns, of Union of Students across Northern Ireland in all of our universities? Well, uh, I, I'm not aware of the, the full details of, of what um, the member um, has, has outlined, um, nor indeed the response of the university authorities to what uh, has been said. What I would encourage the member to do is to get in touch with me and to set out those issues uh, on paper. Uh, I would certainly take a look at that, and I, I would be open to having a meeting uh, with himself and his colleagues as a follow-up to that uh, to further explore the issues and concerns uh, that the member and his colleagues wish to outline. Uh, Pat Ramsey. <coughs> Mr. Ramsey. Thank you, Speaker. Could I ask the Minister to give us an update on the intergovernmental uh, group on the implementation for the one plan for my constituency? Well, 
It's probably not in, in something that I can give a response to, given that um, it, it is something that's been driven uh, locally uh, in, in terms of, uh, of dairy, in terms of proposals that are being made uh, to, for a, a, a business case uh, re regarding expansion of the, the, the number of places. Um, from my own perspective, um, I am committed uh, to um, trying to reach the 1,000 target by 2015. I feel we've made good progress with 650 plus uh, places already, uh, which is well in excess of anything we had any expectation of doing whenever I assumed office in 2011. To the Minister for Employment and Learning.